Today is September 1st, 2020, and my guest is journalist and author Virginia Postrel. I want to thank Plantronics for providing today's guest with the Blackwire 5220 headset. Virginia last appeared on Econ Talk. It's hard to believe, but it was November of 2006. Talking about style, her latest book is The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. Virginia, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's great to be with you. I want to remind listeners, you can watch this interview on YouTube if all goes well, and you can listen to it wherever podcasts are uh, available. Virginia, your book explores the incredible array of stuff that we make fabric from and how that process has evolved over time. Uh, let's start with a simple item, maybe a shirt or a sweater, and talk about how that was made in the past, and then we'll talk about how it's made in the present. So let's start with the past. You need to make some clothes. What would you do in old, olden times? Olden times. Well, first of all, you got to get the fiber. And that might involve growing flax or raising sheep, uh, which in and of itself involves many, many, many centuries and millennia of uh, cultivation and breeding to get the most fiber possible out of the, uh, the plant or animal. Then you've got to harvest it. You've got to clean it, which is an enormously complicated process, time-consuming, often gross, uh, and <laughs> depending on what it is, or so I've heard. This is one thing I haven't. I, I, I did a lot of things during my research, but I did not uh, clean any fibers. Um, and and then you have your fiber and contrast that to today i did uh go to uh, a cotton harvest in lubbock texas and uh, instead of having people bending over in the fields plucking cotton balls off of the plants there are these giant machines that harvest eight rows eight uh, yeah eight rows at a time they come out they have these little, the go and the cotton goes in the front and comes out rolled up in the back and then they take it to the gin and it's similarly a uh, pretty automated process so that's a, a big difference and then once you've got your fiber uh, you have to turn it into thread and this is i think the part that today we most take for granted and it's where the Industrial Revolution started. And I think uh, there's a reason that the Industrial Revolution started with thread. It's not just an accident. It's because it was such a huge leverage point in the standard of living. I have a chart in the book, which uh, we can maybe look at, and of how, how much thread it takes to make certain things. And this is not the thread that you sew with. This is the thread that you weave or knit the fabric out of. So you take a pair of jeans, which in the scheme of things is not that much fabric. A pair of jeans to weave that amount of fabric takes, it, it takes about six miles of thread. Six miles of thread is a lot of thread. Um, and nowadays, you can spin in a modern spinning plant that amount of thread in, in a few seconds. But in the pre-industrial revolution period, the very fastest, best spinners in the world were in India. And they could spin 100 meters of thread an hour. And that means that it would take about 13 days, 13 eight-hour days, to spin the amount of thread in a pair of jeans. And that's before you weave it. It's before you dye it. That's just for the spinning, and it doesn't include all the cleaning and harvesting and any of that. So you can see, at, at a, not in the book, but I recently been working on some videos. I also used a bandana as an example. Bandana is a very small piece of cloth. It's 22 inches square. And it would take 24 labor hours to spin that amount of thread, uh, the amount of thread in a bandana. Uh, in the, and these were the fastest spinners in the world. If you took uh, you know, European wool spinners pre-industrial revolution, they were somewhat slower. So uh, we, and, and the result was women, and unlike weaving, which depending on the culture, sometimes men did it, sometimes women did it, sometimes both, spinning 
throughout history has basically been a female occupation. And it was one of those occupations that every woman did all the time, all the time, because there was so much there, there was so much a shortage of thread. And there, I talk in the book, I have lots of examples, but Aztec or women who were ruled by the Aztec had to turn out enormous amount of cotton cloth for tribute and taxes and so from the time a girl was like three years old she'd be starting to learn how to spin this cotton and her mother would punish her in various ways if she didn't do it uh, it, it was just this unbelievably burdensome uh, occupation it's not an unpleasant thing to do people spin today for fun it can be relaxing you can gossip while you're doing it you can watch your kids you can watch your sheep whatever but it, it was a constant occupation and that's something i think we don't appreciate at all today well it's a deep point because you know when we think about the past and <clears throat> i think we're all aware that we have more clothes in our closet than people in the past had in their closets if they had a closet and you know when i they think about that they didn't have closets <laughs> yeah of course not but but when i think it was because they didn't need any because they only had yeah. like three shirts or one shirt yeah. Yeah. and i never thought about why other than the obvious answer that clothes were more expensive in the past what that meant really was is that the number of hours it took to create the thread let alone weave it into the fabric that you need to make the shirt and then cut it and sew it etc uh, was immense. Uh, a sheet, you point out, is how many miles of thread on yeah, a twin so bed sheet? Yeah, so I have to look at my cheat sheet. I should remember it. But a, a, a twin sheet is 29 miles of thread, and that's yeah. a tw that's at a 200 thread count. So that's just a you know basic Walmart sheet. That's not but, anything fancy. Yeah, and so but, that would have taken uh, 59 days. Of, just it, for the thread. At the, Indi at the Indian spinning rate. And if you take like this is a different fiber and it's not an exact comparison, but if you take the speed at which uh, European women spun using spinning wheels, that would have been 65 days. They spun wool, cotton is actually harder to spin, but to get the general concept, you can see the, uh, uh, the, the, the comparison, yeah. So one of the things that's uh, educational and fascinating about your book is that I suspect some of our listeners have not spent a lot of time thinking about where thread comes from other than the store. Uh, you know, you buy thread, it, it looks like this cool thing that goes on forever, it's on a spool. Yeah. Um, I, and if you'd said to me, okay, you need to make that, you need to, to create enough cotton thread to wrap around a little sp a spool like that. Right. Um, Okay, well, I got the cotton uh, bowl, this this ball-like thing, right? And I'd start stretching it out, which is a, yeah. it's a relevant thing to do. Yes, that's very important. Getting before you start spinning, you have to get the fibers kind of more or less pointed in the right direction to to get it going. Yeah. Well, then I'd pull them out, and then I'd have a thread. <laughs> it'd be about it'd be about four inches, six inches long. And then I'd have to get another piece of cotton, and I would say, well, what am I going to tie a knot? Well, there's no yeah. knot in the thread in the store on the spindle, on the spool. So how do you get a yeah. little thing of cotton right, or so 50 it, it, it's, things of cotton it, to make yeah. a 29, 25 miles of thread? It seems well, impossible. It, it's, but the amazing thing, and this is what's so impressive about this, is people all around the world <laughs> figured, it figured out. out how to do it. Basically, what you have to do is you have to simultaneously stretch out and twist the thread. So, And the twisting makes it stronger because it creates a kind of helix that the more the, – where the forces operate to hold it together. It's a, But you have to get the, the balance between the twisting it and the pulling it out just right. I mean, I, I – did do a little spinning and I was never any good at it because I never could get that exact balance. When you see somebody who knows how to spin, it's it looks like magic. It looks like they're just kind of making this something out of nothing. Um, but the base, the first way that spinning was developed and the 
way that was developed all around the world, every culture you can imagine practically came up with something similar, is you have a stick and you have a weight. Uh, usually, depending on what materials were around, it could be made out of clay, it could be made out of stone, and you have a hole in the middle of it. And archaeologists find lots of these spindle whorls. The sticks rot away, but the spindle whorls are, stay. And the you put the stick through the, the hole in the middle, and that little weight increases the angular momentum. It sort of helps you manage it. And you you start the stick spinning, and the thread the the fiber comes down, and it turns little by little into thread and then you wrap it around the spindle and you know but how do you get you the next to... how do you attach the next piece once you run out of the all the you, fibers you in just, that first it's cotton the ball the same way you use the same way you just keep feeding it to the next thing and it the twisting and stretching is what puts the next piece on it so everything wh one thing that you learn when you study textiles is how incredibly important friction is yeah because it's all held together basically with friction the thread is, i'm oversimplifying a little bit physicists don't write me but uh, but engineer <laughs> <laughs> but the thread is being held together by the way the the fibers are twisted uh, on, on each other then you start to if you weave, it's just layered. It's all about friction. Um, and, and in weaving, it's all about keeping those threads from doing what they want to do, which is tangling into a big mess. Uh, <laughs> um, in knitting, it's looping. Uh, but everything is kind of just held together by friction. So in a modern thread factory, yeah, it's, quote, the same technology where it's just done more quickly it's still Sim just the twisting it's, of, it's, of yeah, one piece it's, to another um it's similar it, yes it is it's it is it's a little there are two technologies that are, are that are used the the one that is dates to the industrial revolution and you know obviously it's been dramatically improved and in, increased is essentially pulling out and twisting the fiber uh and rollers and very high speed and very precise machinery do it and it's very very fast there is a, a somewhat newer technology that essentially uses air and it twists just the outside of the fiber and um some people think it's not the people who are really into like high quality denim don't approve of this kind of thread but it's it's it creates a similar kind of effect uh, it just a little bit faster and a little bit quieter okay so to come back to our process we 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 take our animal or our plant right. we stretch out whatever we got off it from it until we make thread right uh, and we do we um do we make fabric first or do we dye it first? We make the fabric first, right? Or well, it, that depends. depends, actually. You know, we have this phrase, dyed in the wool. I dyed in the wool, Yankees fan, I dyed in the wool, conservative, whatever. Well, that is about that, that question. You can dye at any stage. You can dye the fabric. Oh, dear, somebody. You can dye the fabric. You can dye the thread. You can even dye the fiber. Uh, if you dye the thread first, you will probably get a more evenly dyed fabric uh, because if you have a big piece of fabric and you put it in a dye vat, uh, if you're not very careful, it can fold and the dye will penetrate some parts more than other parts. Um, and you know, when I've occasionally experimented with dying at home, I found this to be true. <laughs> just you get a slight, you're going for an overall effect, but you get a little bit of a tie dye effect, even though you're not deliberately doing tie dyes. Uh, so it depends on what you're trying to achieve at what, even in the past, what technologies you're using, what fibers you're dying. So for example, wool and silk protein fibers are much easier to dye. They just suck up the dye compared to plant fibers, which are cellulose based. They are, they are not as easy to dye. So yeah, yeah. so to die you, for. <clears throat> yeah, to die for exactly. Sorry about so that. you you can um, you can 
But let's say that you create the fabric next because that's the way my book is organized. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Go ahead. So make <laughs> yeah. your fabric. Yeah. So, How do I do that? I've got the thread. Now what? Okay. Well, I'm a weaver. So I learned to weave while I was researching the book and I kind of got into it. So um, I think of and, – and weaving is much older than knitting. There are a million different kinds of looms around the world. And this is, again, something that people figured out all around the world in different ways. And, and in this case, unlike with the spindle whorls, the technologies are quite different in, in many places. But basically what you need is something that will hold what are called the warp threads, which are the very strong structural threads, steady, hold them in tension hold them straight and then you can insert the weft threads over we think of it as over under over under sort of like when you're in kid when you're a kid and you do it with construction paper there's another thing that's a critical technology that was invented to weave and that is what is known as heddles which are originally strings often they're metal but it's something that ties around the warp threads and allows you to lift them individually or or more often say say you're doing over under over under you have a bar with heddles and it lifts all the odd threads and then you have another one that lifts all the even threads so that you can put the cross threads through and there are many ways of playing with this and creating patterns uh, the possibilities are pretty infinite especially when you get fairly complex looms or again going back to if you want to do it by hand you can individually pick up the threads and there are forms of weaving that are that are like that um so but essentially uh fabric which is seems like cheating seems impossible but fabric is basically uh, this over under idea, not always, but this over under idea, which is a form of, you know, if you're listening to this at home, it's like braiding. You're passing things over and under different pieces to create this crossword puzzle, this weave of threads. And when I, you're done, what, if I did it, you just have a big mess. <laughs> so obviously the loom holds it tight, like you say, so you can, you know, systematically do this. But you obviously have to keep the threads that are the, the um, what's it's weft. What okay. is it? Weft is what you're inserting. It goes right. It goes from weft to right. Okay. <laughs> That's how you can remember it. And warp is sort of the hard. Taut. It sounds like hard taut. Yeah. Okay. That's the so taut. the warp threads are sitting there. And then the you take the weft one. You put one through. Now I'm going to put another one next to it. It can't get over on it on top yeah. of it because then it's going to be a problem. And right. if it's too far away, it's not going to hold together. So how do you do that? So, okay, so first of all, you have these heddles that lift the threads okay. so that you can get, go alternate one after the other. And then you usually have something that's called a beater. Uh, if you're using a loom like the kind of European floor looms that were you or even that are used today, mechanized and computerized, it, it's something that comes forward and pushes the threads. Um, depending on what type of loom you could also just use a flat stick and push them down so that they go together uh tightly as as you put in each row of weft but one thing that i learned when i learned to weave that i didn't really appreciate uh beforehand is that putting the weft threads in and back and forth especially if you're doing a fairly plain what's called a plain weave which is just over under that's not the hard part. The hard part is setting it up in the first place, getting those warp threads taut, keeping them taut, uh, making sure that they don't tangle. That is an incredibly difficult process and uh, takes – people get good at it. I have not yet gotten good at it because I don't weave enough. But that's where a lot of the, uh, the setup time is and also a lot of the setup expertise because if you – are going to make a pattern with say different colored threads in you're going to make stripes or you, something like that you need to get the right number and you need to get them in the right order and you need to think about it 
uh, ahead of time. And then if you come to something that's really complicated, like kente cloth, I talk some about in the book, which is woven in little strips and then the strips are put together and to make a big cloth which is worn like a toga you have to plan the strips which has some complexities but then you have to think about how it all fits together so there's a lot of brain power in in all of these both its traditional textiles and of course in the industrial ones today well, I want to go back just to the plane. Let's just stick, keep with the plane thing. I mean, obviously, up, patterns. Up, down, up, down, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've got a um, the warp threads, and their, their width is going to determine the width of the piece of fabric I'm going right. to end up with, right? Right, yes. So let's say I'm doing a bed sheet or uh, a blanket, make it easy. So I, I go, I do all the, I have the tight warp threads, then I have the weft threads going up and down. And after I've done that a bunch and I've kept them close together and I've kept it tight, at the end, I've got a giant rectangle right. with a bunch of loose threads on the end. I, I, what, 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 what do I do with the ends? What do you do with the ends? Well, there's several things you can do with them. I'd burn um, them. I'd singe them. And, 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 <laughs> no, <laughs> don't burn. That only that only burning and singes is only going to work if they're nylon. And okay. We're in the olden days before nylon. <laughs> um well, probably you just – if you're making something like a bed sheet or a tablecloth or a, a sari or something, you probably just hem it. You probably just roll it under and sew it. Um, if you are a hand weaver today, hobbyist hand weaver, uh, and you're making, say, a scarf or a shawl or even if you're in the olden times, um, you there are various ways of knotting and, and uh, tying off the okay. – the ends, yeah, but that is an issue. You do have to now on the the sides. You have what are called selvages. That's the the side where each pass of weft wraps around. So on the two sides, it will be finished, and that's what how. What do you mean? If you're, Explain that. Okay. What do you mean wraps you, around? Okay, so your your weft is a continuous thread. It's on a spindle of some type. It's on a on a it I'll is? It. Yes. It is? You don't put a new one each time. Oh, I, yeah. okay. That's a breakthrough okay, for me. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, no, that's... <laughs> this, is, this is a great example of Stupidity. sort of unarticulated yeah. <laughs> knowledge. You know, I, I left out a critical step. Yeah, so when you – it doesn't have to be. And, in fact, when people make sort of wall hangings and sometimes they'll just put – one thread of something colorful uh, but generally speaking if you're making fabric your weft thread is on a continuous spool of some sort usually called a, a bob and they're usually sort of long and skinny if you look really carefully at my earring this is a little baby weaving shuttle <laughs> so that would be the thread and it would be in this shuttle, and you'd pass it back and forth. Um, so, sorry, I should have brought more props. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so you have this the weft thread in a shuttle. You pass it through under, let's say, under all the odd odd warp threads are lifted up. You pass it through under the odd warp threads. Then you put down the odd threads. You beat it. You lift up all the even threads. You put the weft back through. The other direction. The other direction. Cool. Then back and forth. So then when you finish your – when you when you're done with however many yards of fabric you're weaving, the two sides are finished. And one mark of a good hand weaver is how even their selvages are. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really good at it, they'll look quite finished. And we, this is something we take for granted. You go to buy fabric in the fabric store, all the salvages on these industrial fabrics are all even. Uh, sure. But that's because they have – they've put that knowledge of how to do it into the machines. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a tricky thing. But then there still are, to go to your original question, it still are the other two ends. The ends where the warp threads are yeah. will okay. be open. And so if I'm making a scarf on my hand loom at home, what I will do is 
when I set it up, what, before I get started, I'll do a few rows and then I will what's called hem stitch, which is a way of finishing off. And then eventually I'll put fringes on it. But if you were going to make a sheet or a tablecloth or something like that, you would probably just hem it. Okay. Because when you think about it, if you sew, which I'm guessing you don't, uh, at least, oh, but Virginia. when one. <laughs> But okay, I don't. You are used to this. I mean, why we have hems on our clothes is because of that problem. Is because there is there are loose threads and they need to be finished off and hidden away. Your book opens with a number of contributions of weaving and textiles and fabric to the English language, but you just hit on one of my favorites. You know, to be at loose ends. Yes, it's not good. Yeah. It's like yeah. I'm unraveling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, the amount of uh, text, textile terminology in the English language, and we talked about dyed in the wool earlier, it is enormous. And it's not just English, it's in every language. And one of the things that's striking about weaving versus knitting is all the words that refer to weaving are very, very ancient words. And the words that refer to knitting are much more recent and in some cases get borrowed from other languages. So like Russian uses the French word for knitting because I guess that's where they learned to knit or something like that, yeah. Well, like um, you mentioned a shuttle, which is a thing that carries the thread right. back and forth right. across the face yeah. of the warp threads. Uh, you suggested that's where the shuttle bus idea that is, or shuttle that to the is plane. Where, yeah, yeah, that's where shuttle comes from. Is well, it's the, perfect because you're going back and forth. On the other hand, forth. this type of shuttle is called a boat shuttle. So it also has the idea it looks like a little canoe or something. And okay. Carry, so, yeah. Cool. So in ancient times, one of the lessons that you get from our conversation, I think, is that uh, you know, in general, even when you're wealthy, waste is a bad thing. Uh, yeah. You don't like to throw out excess stuff. You want to try to find a use for it. Um, you know, my favorite of those is that in the pencil factory, at least until maybe recently, maybe still happens, the shavings of the cedar that come out of the creation of a wood pencil get collected and are used as bedding for turkeys. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you're take, you have a piece of this fabric and you want to create a dress or a shirt or a skirt or a pair of pants, those extra pieces after you've cut the pattern, they're kind of precious because they came out of that thread thing that took well, forever. So there are two points here. One is if you look around the world and through history at most garments, they are not tailored. They are not cut into mm. little pieces. Like I mentioned kente cloth and I said it was worn like a toga. You could take a sari. These are rectangular pieces of fabric that are draped. Or a kimono is made of rectangles. Um, and in fact, peasant clothing in Europe, if you think about a classic, you have to get a picture in your head, but you think about a, a, a sort of a medieval or, or early modern painting of peasants in the field and the woman has a wide skirt. Well, that's basically a rectangle that's been sewn into a circle and gathered. And it so you haven't wasted any fabric and you, if it gets a rip or something, you'll mend it. Um, and if you think about um, even I don't know if you've ever seen the the G's Bend quilts, but they're these well, very well-known uh, quilts from an African-American uh, community in the South that were made out of people's work clothes. And they're also – and they're, the reason they're famous is they have this kind of modernist aesthetic to them uh, that was developed sort of separate from modernism. And um, they're based on – keeping pretty big pieces. So when you think about something like the classic patchwork quilt that we have in the Americas, it is a post-industrial revolution artifact. It is made after people can waste a certain amount. They're not really wasting it because they're turning it into blankets, but they can have where everybody can have tailored clothes that have lots of little scraps of material left over. And then you can turn that into a new 
art slash useful form, which is patchwork quilts. But most, we think about these highly tailored gowns that we see in Renaissance paintings, but those are the clothing, the clothes of the very wealthy, very wealthy people who are in fact putting a huge amount of their wealth into luxury textiles, uh, into velvets and which are made from silk and have very elaborate brocades. And these are incredibly, not only do they're incredibly time consuming to produce, uh, the, the resources come from far away, the silk and such. So the typical peasant is wearing a shirt or a skirt or both that are made of rectangles that are worn until they fall apart, that are patched, uh, that may be passed down from generations. And things like the idea of uh, of a, a woman having a hope chest of bed linens and pillowcases and things for when she gets married, that's because those linens were very valuable. It wasn't like, oh, I, uh, you know, my kid is moving into their dorm. Let's go to Target and pick up some some sheets and and pillowcases it was like oh my god pillowcases they're so valuable yeah well those people were in those gowns everybody else is in a burlap bag with a <laughs> hole cut in it right and i never thought about it the whole a tunic a tunic is essentially a, a rectangle. rectangle with a hole yeah. in the middle for your head and a belt to keep it around your waist yeah right well and actually it's made by it, it they didn't i don't think that there's a hole I think that what it is is it's sewn in such a way that rectangles are put together so that there there's a gap. So I don't think there's like a little bit of waste oh, yeah. where they cut out a hole. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> although if we were making one, that's how we would make it. Probably. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I get, I see it now. Yeah. Um, before I forget, I want to. Uh, many people have heard of the phrase luddite, which is today means anti-technology. Right. Uh, it comes from the textile world. Uh, explain. Yeah, so the Luddites were the actual Luddites who use that term were people who men who were making really good money weaving on hand looms, not powered. And when powered looms came in, they feared unemployment and their wages went down and they were not happy and they started busting up looms. But what's interesting to me about the Luddites is they are latecomers because long before the Luddites, the Luddites are these great beneficiaries of the industrial production of thread because the industrial production of thread eliminated that thread used to be the blockage, there was a shortage of thread, the uh, the bottleneck, exactly. Thread used to be the bottleneck. Uh, There was a shortage of thread compared to the amount of cloth that could be woven because people were spinning all the time making as much thread as they could and it was never enough, it was never enough. And and you could say, well, why don't they just raise the, the wages? Well, you could do that, but then nobody could afford the cloth because it's so time consuming. So we got industrial spinning, we got the industrial revolution. Suddenly there's plenty of thread. It's no longer the bottleneck. Now the weaving is the bottleneck. The weaving is what people, and then the weavers started to make a lot of money or, you know, not by our standards, but more by money. The, more money. They were, they were sort of industrial aristocrats. They made a lot of money. So when, industrial spinning came in, there were, I guess we could call them proto-Luddites. There were people who were busting up those machines too um, and attacking them. And they referred to them as patent machines uh, because they had patents on them. And, uh, but that was basically the same thing. People were had been making money spinning and they didn't like it and they didn't like the the replacement and and so the Luddites were sort of latecomers and then later um, uh, 
when the jacquard looms came in in France, uh, which at the time were considered a great advance because you could make complex patterns very easily all of a sudden. But at first, the weavers in Lyon, which was the great French textile center, uh, ran Monsieur Jacquard out of town, even though he was honored by the government and such, um, because they were afraid it for their livelihoods. Although it turned out that they eventually adopted the technology and they became sort of labor aristocrats and, and Lyon became a, a center. Uh, the weavers were actually a, a potent uh, sort of labor movement force uh, there. But there is in the history of textiles a constant ebb and flow of fortunes. I kept thinking about fortune's wheel, which was this Renaissance concept of you know, one day one day you're on top and the next day you're not. And people's occupations ebb and flow in value. Parts of the world are more or less successful. Um, it, thinking about textiles is a great way to sort of think about global history and to, to come to appreciate its complexity and its cycles. And well, you know, here here in the United States, you had the textile mills of uh, Massachusetts, Lawrence and Lowell were big centers. Then somebody decided to find cheaper labor in North Carolina, and that became the center. And then they found cheaper labor overseas. And, right. and of course, the people who had those good livelihoods tried to keep out competition. I think, I think somebody wrote a book called Enemies of the Future. <laughs> uh, the future that was you. and its enemies. <laughs> the future and its enemies. Uh, thank you. Well, I like the phrase enemies of the future. And, and these folks were the enemies of the future. They, they fought against change because dynamism is uh, hard to deal – change is sometimes hard to deal with. And so it's – it's um, it is a very central – cloth. you know, I keep thinking – you know, we talk about fabric and thread and dyeing and weaving and knitting. But what we're really talking about most of the time – there are other things, of course – but most of the time we're talking about clothes, kind of well, central. <laughs> we are talking about clothes, but it's very important to understand that we're not talking – only about clothes, and particularly in a world before plastic, which is itself a descendant of of, uh, of textiles in a certain way. We're talking about sails and bags and tents and sheets and bandages and pillowcases and baby's diapers, which I suppose are a form of clothes, but we're, we're, textiles are everywhere and in earlier times they were even more prominent than they are today because today a lot of things that used to be done with textiles are done with plastics even something like the coating on uh, a, a an electrical cord so obviously there you're talking you know late 19th early 20th century up until World War II, that would have been wrapped in what is essentially cloth. Um, today, it would be wrapped in uh, in plastic. But textiles are everywhere, and that is why they have both been a huge source of employment over time and a huge source of unemployment with the 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 dynamism that makes for progress and and why that has led that seemingly bad news of people being put out of work has led to such huge gains in the standard of living so you get real displacement in the short term and real suffering in the short term but enormous gains over i would say the medium term even i mean if you think about the proportion of time that a person in uh the Middle Ages, let alone a thousand years before, but certainly the Middle Ages spent to clothe themselves. Yeah, uh, and absolutely. how little time we have to spend clothing ourselves. Uh, I have way too many shirts, way too many of lots of things because they're so inexpensive that I don't think about it so much. And in ancient and primitive times, it was the main thing you spent, quote, money on. It wasn't literally money sometimes, it was often your time. And yeah. it was time you couldn't spend 
cultivating your food, your food in various ways, or you know. Leisure, I, you know, you, you used eight-hour days. I, I know you were. Yeah, it's a, it's I used a useful those because metric. it's familiar, not because yeah. that's really the. Because uh, people were number. spending twelve to fifteen hours a day, making sure they had enough to eat and that they had clothes. <laughs> right. But I never thought about clothes. Clothes you just have, but of course, to get them, it was unbelievably time-consuming. And so the transformation of the standard of living of the to the modern world, a huge part of it is the transformation of that process of clothing creation through the application of technology. And your book has a mix of both, you know, the improvements in 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 hand creation of these things. Yeah. Obviously were extensive and as you say, the you know, sheep with more wool and, and cotton that's larger and better protected from whatever. But the turning of the the thread part and the fabric part, that the Industrial Revolution just was incredibly transformative. Right. So the two huge leaps in technology are learning how to spin, and then we haven't talked about dyeing. Yeah, let's talk um, about that. Yeah. So dyeing led to the chemical industry, and the chemical industry changed everything. Uh, it gave us wonder drugs and agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, photographic chemicals, uh, obviously plastics, synthetic fibers, all kinds of things. And people love to rag on the chemical industry uh, uh, because it's, you know, it's environmentally unfriendly in some ways. It's um, unnatural. It's unnatural. Well, nothing is natural, basically. <laughs> That's one of the takeaways from the fiber chapter is yep. the that there's no such thing as natural fibers. Um, they're all they're all genetically modified. Um, but so here behind me is a, a textile that I bought in India. It's a hand printed textile and it's representative of what have, have accurately been called the, the fabrics that changed the world. And those were Indian printed cottons. And they were unlike anything that Europeans had seen when they first started to be imported. They first came into Europe in the early 1600s. In the 1600s, 1700s, they were huge. Uh, everybody liked them. They were lightweight. They were washable. The dyes, the Indian dyeing technologies were quite advanced. They had figured out how to keep them from fading much more than Europeans. And they were dyed on cotton, which earlier I mentioned is, is difficult. Well, one thing that inspired is better cotton spinning and the Industrial Revolution. Um, but another that it inspired was a lot of research into dyes right at the time that modern chemistry was starting to be developed. So modern chemistry and the dye industry grew up together in a sense. So they obviously dyeing had existed in Europe and other parts of the world since ancient times, but the idea of trying to scientifically understand what was happening in dye processes was a new one. And over time, if you if you were in the 18th century and you were a sort of nerdy, interested in the cutting edge of scientific research, one thing that you might do is work in a dye house uh, where you would apply sort of scientific methodologies, that is systematic testing, to try to figure out how to get the results that you wanted. It was a long time before any of this sort of application of scientific methodology to dyeing actually led to understanding what the heck was going on. But when it did in the, in the 19th century, and you got synthetic dyes for the first time, not only did you have an explosion of affordable colors that everybody could have and people started wearing quite bright color colors in the 19th century but you also had the funding of a career path and research laboratories uh, that advanced chemistry uh, so that sort of dye fortunes funded further chemical research and further 
chemical development because there was a lot of money there. If you if you could figure out how to do better dyes because textiles were a huge industry, you could make a lot of money. So we're, we're recording this the week that we released uh, the Econ Talk conversation with Matt Ridley on the difference ah. between invention and innovation. And you know, one of his themes is that a lot of the great innovations of history were not by scientists, but by bicyclists, craftsmen, blacksmiths, tinkerers, uh, and that this once they found something that worked, the scientists would figure out why it worked eventually, and then they'd improve it. But the the history of dyeing is a beautiful example of that. Uh, talk about why the dye house where the dyeing took place was often very far from town. Oh, yes. Yes. One thing that I mentioned in and the remember, chemical industry. Remember, Virginia, there are little children listening and sensitive people. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so so the, the chemical industry has a bad rep because of environmental impacts. And I talk some about people who are working to reduce those. But we are naive if we think that unpleasant externalities, as uh, economists would call them, only started with the Industrial Revolution. One thing you learn about dyeing, if you do any of it yourself, uh, is that it can be a very stinky process. Uh, uh, indigo, which is a miraculous dye, and again, something that was developed in many different parts of the world uh, using different plants that have the same chemicals in them. Uh, it, it's an amazing process, and I can't believe anybody figured it out, but they did uh, take several steps. But in many cases, it really stinks. Uh, it smells like urine. It smells like various stinky things. Uh, Elizabeth I required that any woad production, which was the European indigo, be – it be far away from any of her palaces because of the smell from it. And indigo is nothing compared to Tyrian purple, the ancient shellfish purple that was highly prized in Roman times and uh, up through the Byzantine period, where you've not only got all kinds of smelly dyes, but you've also got rotting flesh from these snails and flies and all kinds of really disgusting things. So it's it's a process, it's a chemical process and, and you're changing chemicals and many of those are organic chemicals that are not too pleasant to smell. I'm gonna talk about the shellfish, the snails and mollusks that were the source yeah. of some of the richer colors of around the Mediterranean. Uh, was there a tragedy, the commons problem there? Because you'd have to kill a lot of snails to get that dye out, to dye a lot, I would think, to dye a lot of material. And you talk about somebody, you know, crushed 100 snails for some yeah. little thing. How did they, did, did, did they die out at one point? And did, no, did that, was that, that a is a myth. Okay. Um, you will often read that they were hunted to extinction. And you might think there was a tragedy of the commons. I, I don't know why there wasn't, but there doesn't seem to be. No, what died out was the knowledge of how to do the dying. Because what happened was, so in ancient Roman times, anybody could who could afford it could wear this special purple, which wasn't really purple. It was sort of, it was described as the color of clotted blood. Um, Lovely. <laughs> I know, it doesn't sound very pretty to us, but, <laughs> and, and by the way, it still smelled even after the dying, unlike say indigo, um, your genes don't smell, but if you had this purple, you could tell it was authentic because the cloth would smell, because there were counterfeits. I mean, you could get a similar effect using other sources. Anyway, what happened was in Roman times, anybody could buy it. It was very expensive, and so it was for elites, but it was more like an economic elite. In the Byzantine Empire, which is in the early Middle Ages, it became exclusively limited to the court. It became literally a royal color. And then when the Byzantine Empire fell to the Ottomans, uh, to the, the, the Muslims, that that knowledge which had been concentrated in a few people in the court, that knowledge was lost, essentially. It died out. 
And so those those mollusks are still there in the Mediterranean. And I talk about a, a, a researcher who, with her grad student, went to figure out how this was done and got, harvested them and, and all that. They're still there, but the exact techniques have been forgotten. Uh, so that one thing that I sort of came to appreciate in doing this was both how knowledge sharing, how important knowledge sharing is in spreading technology and spreading knowledge, but also how it can die out. So this was an example of something dying out. Another example was the Incans were amazing weavers. Um, and one of the things that's famous about them, they were very textile-based culture. One of the things that's famous about them is they, they kept records on knotted threads, which are called kipu. And these, the knowledge of how to interpret these records has largely died out and people still make advances on trying to decipher them. But also they did a kind of weaving that's called double weave, which was two, you weave two layers simultaneously and then you can either, you can either make like a little pocket or you can, depending on where you put the selvages, you can spread it out. And that knowledge survived elsewhere in the Americas, but it was actually lost in Peru until a few years ago, it was reintroduced by an, an American weaver who had learned how to do it from other people. And, and uh, so you can lose how to do things. And so that's one, one thing to keep in mind when we talk about civilization. One thing that I've thought about is like, what do we mean when we say civilization? And there are lots of different meanings, but one of them is this sort of continuity of shared knowledge and experience and uh, sort of, it's more than culture. You can have different cultures within the same civilization. Uh, you, you mentioned that, that only the wealthy or only the wealthy would afford or could afford some of these fancier patterns or cloth or dyes. Uh, talk about the role of fabric in status. Uh, mm -hmm. you, I interviewed you about style back yeah. in 2006. You've since written a book on glamour and uh, fabric, textiles, dye, fashion are all driven by the same, these innovations in fabric, color, pattern, um, dye, the, op the opportunity yeah. to have certain colors. Uh, they, that's played a, a role all through history. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is important for us rich moderns to remember is that people didn't wait to be rich to have, say, colorful cloth. Plain cloth, will protect you just as well as colored cloth. And yet people started dying practically as soon as they started weaving. It, it's because people like decoration and they like, whether it's self-expression, whether it's status, whether it's simply the beauty of it. And so you find in ancient textiles, you find complex weaves, you find plaids, you find stripes, you find colorful dyes, um, you find people going to enormous lengths to figure out how to do things like make red or, or make blue. Um, that it's easy to make yellow. Yellows and browns are easy, but, but other kinds of colors can be difficult. And it's not just about status, but certainly textiles play a big role in status. Um, there are uh, I have a chapter called Consumers, which is sort of about the the demand side of the, the market for textiles. And much of that chapter is about how people define sumptuary laws, which in many cases were limit, supposed to limit what textiles a person could wear based on their status or just based on everybody was supposed to limit them. And they had different purposes. So in some place like China, they were very much designed to imp to maintain a certain Confucian hierarchy of classes where the merchants were low down and the scholars were high up and, and, and that sort Seems of thing. Seems fair. 
It just seems fair, right? Kidding. And there were very specific ranks that could wear specific things, and they tended to get eroded for, uh, in many cases, by the court itself. In Renaissance Italy, the motivation seems to have been completely different. These were mercantile cities. They weren't trying to keep merchants in their place, keep the the uppity uh, nouveau riche from, from showing off. They were trying to create a cartel of themselves. There's self-control. They were trying to say, no, honey, you can't have that new dress. It's against the law uh, <laughs> because they were trying to control their family budgets essentially by making it illegal to buy certain more than a certain number of very fancy expensive garments and that totally didn't work <laughs> but but it's an interesting example of we tend to think of sumptuary laws as being imposed from the top down trying to keep the the rising middle classes or whoever down and that's often the case or as having a moral component. But in the Renaissance Italian cities, they seem to really be uh, an attempt at financial self-discipline and a woefully <laughs> unsuccessful one. Um, in, in Japan, you had a very interesting phenomenon in Edo, Japan, um, under, under the shogunate, where they had sumptuary laws that prohibited the townspeople, which would include merchants, uh, from wearing certain things. And in, instead of just breaking the laws, there the merchants figured out ways of creating their own sense of style, which was actually more fashionable, and it was based on being more understated. So it wasn't that you wore your fanciest textiles on the outside, you'd wear them on the lining of your kimono and they would just show a little bit or they figured out ways of mimicking certain patterns and new, new techniques and that sort of thing. I, I love the phrase uh, sumptuary law. Uh, did they call it that? Or is that what we've labeled it? I you know? think that's what we've labeled it. I yeah. think that's a, a recent recent term. I don't know for sure. Sumptuous is a word you don't hear that often. It's a very good SAT word. Um, it means, it's, I guess, luxurious, rich, um, it, it's ornate. Often, it's often used to describe textiles, sumptuous yeah. fabrics. Yeah. And I tend to think of things like velvets and yeah. uh, brocades and silks. Yeah. So reading your book gave me a, a much better appreciation of just the clothes I have and and the sheets I sleep in and, <laughs> and to be grateful that we don't have to spin thread. And of course, we'll put up some YouTube videos of thread spinning and um, spindles and, and the kind of things we, we t and warp and weft that we talked about for people who want to get a, a visual image. But I'm curious how this affected you in in um, in writing, doing the research or writing this book. Has it changed in any way besides giving you a little bit of a hobby of doing some weaving, it sounds like? Well, the weaving has become a big, a big part of my life. More, not so much that I spend so much time weaving, but I got involved in the local hand weavers guild and um, it has tapped my unused executive talents uh, <laughs> by the way that the guild in this sense is just a club it's not, not it's not like a medieval guild where you're not allowed like not allowed to weave unless you're in the yeah. guild and you're not um, smashing any looms are you Virginia? no we're not okay. smashing the looms we actually keep acquiring new ones it's a joke they multiply like rabbits once you start this you end up with a bunch of looms but I would say that the the main effect that it had on me was because we're dealing with deep history going back tens of thousands of years and all around the world, you get a greater appreciation of, of change over time and of really how smart and ingenious humans are. I mean, the, the Industrial Revolution is a great thing. We had the, the great enrichment that Deirdre McCluskey talks about. We had this takeoff and the, the chemical industry that came out of dying is very important. But that wasn't when humans started being smart. Humans started being smart long before that. And anybody who could develop some of these seemingly 
the, these complex patterns on seemingly simple looms and, and this sort of thing, these are very intelligent, creative, ingenious people. And so I, it, I mean, I always appreciated human ingenuity, but it gave me a much deeper appreciation. And you also get a greater sense of how civilizations and cultures come and go and contribute to the ongoing human adventure, uh, even if they may not, some in some cases fade completely into oblivion, in other cases just not be as dominant as they were before. So you get an appreciation of, of human beings and all their manifestations, good and bad. I mean, there's some really brutal stories in, in the book as well. Um, people, people want what they want and they're not necessarily humanitarian about how to get it. Um, and so it, it's, I would say looking at this common human experience of making and using cloth has just given me a much deeper appreciation of common human experience in general. And you think about how little effort most of us put into getting our food, which is another area that used to be central to human experience and now is much smaller because of technology. In the middle of the pandemic, my wife built a small garden and we've been eating cucumbers and I don't like tomatoes, but she's eating the tomatoes. You don't like tomatoes. What's not raw. Wrong with you? I, li- I like cooked tomatoes, uh, and I like I like the basil that she that she's been growing. Uh, and it's a wondrous thing to to put a seed in the ground and watch something come out of it that you can eat. And you could argue that as we've left farming, and you know something like two percent of Americans are involved in the agricultural industry, and it used to be forty to sixty. It was forty as recently as nineteen hundred. As a big transformation in life. And similarly, now that I've read your book, I realize that the other big part of life besides getting food on the table and boiling the water and getting the water and chopping the wood to build the fire that you could heat the water to cook the, the dinner uh, was just making thread uh, to yeah. get the clothes that you could wear. And that's all changed. And I'm curious, you know, as a as an amateur weaver and, and those who are listening who might be involved in this uh, very ancient craft. Uh, does that is that is that a nice thing? I, my, my wife loves to garden. It's not because just because. Oh, that way we don't have to buy cucumbers. It's just right. deeply fulfilling. Right. It goes back to our ancient past and roots right. and who we are. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I have to remind people that we didn't just grow fiber. Of we didn't just grow food. We also right. grew fiber, and that in fact. Uh, part of ab- agriculture and animal husbandry going back to very ancient times uh, was the production of fiber for textiles, whether you're talking about wool or flax or cotton. Silk was a huge, huge endeavor. It actually has its own name, which is called sericulture, which is like agriculture, but for silk. Um, you learn something yeah, every week on econ talk. Yeah, yeah. I, so... <laughs> And there's a lot about sericulture in the book. I do think that making, to use the fashionable term, is a very fulfilling human activity. Um, however, I will also say that learning to weave and uh, at a time where if you really screw up, you can throw out the thread and start over and not feel terrible about it is, is a wonderful luxury to have <laughs> as opposed to, oh no, you spent you know, weeks and weeks spinning that thread, you better find a way to use it. Um, so that one of the things we can enjoy now is to do these fulfilling of uh, art, artisanal crafts, and in some cases just real art um, in ways where we don't have it's not life and death or it's it's we have a lot of margins to adjust and that's true with people who knit it's certainly true with people who make quilts um and it's not just in textiles it's true for woodworking it's true for gardening many many of these very fulfilling kinds of uh, things where we make things with our hands and we understand them and they're personalized and uh 
and special in a way that something that's mass produced may not be. But it makes me appreciate mass production more, not less. Uh, there's this kind of attitude that's sometimes out there in the artisanal world that it would be better if everything were artisanal. Well, no, it would not. We would be incredibly poor and you wouldn't have time to be weaving scarves because you would be trying to make sure that your children had clothes. Um, so I think that we can appreciate the beauty and craft and of traditional ways of making things at the same time that we appreciate the bounty of the uh, industrial and in and our days electronic computerized world. My guest today has been has been Virginia Postrel. Her book is The Fabric of Civilization. Virginia, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.